The following is a recording of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu. Okay, looks like we got a lot of folks here now. So, it'll take me a couple of weeks to make sure I have all the names straight. But, uh, <clears throat> now, uh, I don't know, uh, Farhad, are you on there? We've not heard back from him whether he's doing MP3. All right, David Blizzard's here. Sean, you're there, aren't you? Hey. Uh, Ryan Colvin, that's MP3. Timothy, Alex, uh, Matthew, Timothy Freitag, here. there you are. Jo Joseph Gurman, right here. Right, and Melody, we're glad to have her as well. Joshua Ham, you out there? Josh Warner? No, Ham. Joseph. Oh, Joe. Ham. That'd be me. I think it's Joseph. Yeah, she wrote that wrong. I was wondering about that. I thought you had two names, maybe, so. Could be. <laughs> I've got you registered as Joshua. That's going to be trouble when you don't pass anything. <laughs> I think what she did was confusing because this is Joshua Horner. You there? Or is that Joseph too? Yeah. Mr. Horner? Okay. Joshua Horner is here. Oh, all right, very good. Caleb Hugel? Huggle? Caleb? He signed on, but I don't see him. Eric Humkey? Yes, here. All right. Young Sun Jong, probably going to be in P3. He's not gotten back to his in Seoul. So, um, William Johnson? Justin Quazinga. Justin? <clears throat> Jonathan Monty? Jonathan? David Melton? He's up there. Sir, I'm here. Raise your hand. I got to. You could be hard to learn you guys' names. So, all right, I got you. I don't know how long, but. Uh, <laughs> Jeff Hamilton. Tim Pierce. Oh, that says MP3. Vinicius. Kenneth. Pujak? Pujak. 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 Yeah. Polish, Czech, what? Lithuanian. Lithuanian. David. Yeah. Andrew Rutherford? Here. Which one are you? Here. Oh, there you are. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Togrul? Salam, Salam Zada? Here. How do you pronounce your first name? Salam Zade. Oh, she got it backwards. How do you pronounce your last name? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, Salam Zade. My name is Togru. Oh. T O G R U L. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Togru. <clears throat> Jeremy Thomas? Yeah. yeah. Hello, Jeremy. At least you I know. Josh Vogel, uh, 
Brian Williams, did you make it tonight or not? We heard you might not. Okay. And then uh, Armin will be on MP3. <clears throat> well, you people bear with me and Lord willing, we'll know each other sometime before the semester's over. <clears throat> Read a few verses at the end of 2 Timothy 3. Verse 10 through the end of the chapter. Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and suffering, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you've known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. Much of what we'll deal with tonight uh, in the second part of the class, we'll get out of the history part, um, is really summarized here in the end of um, 2 Timothy 3, as Paul is calling a Timothy to persevere, continue, endure, and that which he's learned and is convinced of uh, from childhood. He was taught the sacred writings, which is one of the words in the Bible for itself as the Word of God. And we see that it gives wisdom that leads to salvation that is faith in Christ. And then the classic text, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for doctrine, proof, correction, and instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be equipped for every good work. The primary person in mind there is the minister. But of course, secondarily, the scriptures would be that for all of us. Let's pray. <clears throat> we bless your name, O holy God in heaven. We thank you that you are the God of truth and righteousness, and that in your faithfulness and truth you gave us a word, your word, that is every bit as glorious and wonderful as you are, for it is your word. We thank you for giving us summaries of the teaching of your word, such as the Westminster Standards. And we would ask, Lord, that as we begin this study, that your spirit will enable us to grasp the truth, to understand it in its fullness, and how it works out in our lives individually and in the church. We continue to pray for our country. We ask, Lord, that you would steer this hurricane north and out to sea, and that you would protect uh, the people, and particularly we pray for our brothers and sisters all along the coast, that you will watch over them. We ask these things for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. syllabus that is in um, Populi. Um, I would encourage you, if you've not downloaded it, to do so, so you can actually type notes into it. And I just have it up here for you to follow in the class. So, this... On Populi, it's, uh, it's in PDF format. The word is not available. On I've never done a syllabus in a PDF format. Excuse me, I, I'm, I'm sure it is.
year's as a Word document up, but that got taken down, and this year's is now just a PDF. There are three converters online you can convert into, but So that was the true for Christ and Salvation as well? Uh, Christ and Salvation, it's PDF, but you can download the Word as well. I think. Well, she's going to send it to you, Lord willing. Uh, I think this was a decision that was made uh, in order so the syllabi could not be tampered with. Anyway, so she'll send you one if you want to use that to take notes. So I think it's much more efficient. So anyway, this is a survey of the system of Christian thought using the Westminster Confession of Faith and catechisms as guides with the intent of grounding students in biblical reform theology. It includes required readings in Calvin's Institutes as well as catechism memorization. So these are some of my goals, objectives for uh, you all uh, this semester, that you, through class discussion, demonstrate the ability to do exegetically sound theology, that each student through class discussion will develop skills in biblical critical thinking and be equipped to evaluate non-biblical positions, that each student through two examinations will demonstrate a competent knowledge of the doctrines of the Westminster Standards, that each student will have a cursory knowledge of Calvin's Institutes, that each student will love the truth study recognize the practical benefit of them in his life and ministry, that each student will learn the appropriate questions and answers in the shorter catechism. So that's what we're about. In the curriculum, this course is foundational to really everything else that we're doing here. We're moving to the pinnacle of seeing uh, the majority of you equipped to be pastors and preachers. There'll be some in the deacons program and be some in the MA are auditing, but um, we don't adjust the curriculum uh, in regular courses. Now we'll have two electives for the deacons program and for the elders program, but in terms of what goes on in class, our primary uh, emphasis will always be in preparing men for the gospel ministry. So you, it's all built, you can spell it out in the catalog, you run through your systematics, you'll hear, and then you'll have three semesters um, with no systematics, unless you're an MA student or in the other programs. And then you'll start uh, fall of your third year with prolegomena, and spring of your third year with man and sin, fall of your senior year, your fourth year, Christ and salvation, and then spring eschatology and ecclesiology. So it moves in that direction. We lay a foundation for all your seminary studies here. And then you come back to it. But we put it off till then because we also are trying to do our systematics uh, exegetically from the Greek and Hebrew. It's been difficult the last couple of years. I've had more MA students than MD students. But this, this class that Josh is in is a weird group of people. So <laughs> tell them the order of your courses. <laughs> We're trying to get him out of here on the mission field with him in So anyway, so you won't be doing systematics. Now, if you got your, if you already know your languages really well, then you can jump ahead in the curriculum and get out more quickly. But uh, that's kind of how we're we're operating this on this track. That'll parallel with your church history. And of course, in the um, uh, the preaching, you go from uh, rhetoric, logic, hermeneutics, introduction to preaching, and then the two practica. And then the other pastoral courses will either be at the winter term or during the semester. So that's, that's how it's put together. I'm sure you already knew that, but uh, anyway. So we will be using uh, Dr. Smith's harmony 
The idea of the harmony goes all the way back to Princeton Seminary with uh, old Dr. Green, and uh, then eventually Dr. Smith uh, did his harmony, um, and we've used it here. I, 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 I had this course under Dr. Smith in 1968-69. It was life transforming for me. Uh, and so this is always the course that, of, of all the courses, always the course I wanted to teach. It was the last one he gave up. <laughs> he always wanted to teach it too. But anyway, um, so we'll be working through this. A couple times we go out of order uh, in terms of the doctrines, but that's what, and then if you're interested, uh, this is nice. This is the Reformed Confessions harmonized. And uh, Dr. Beakey and Sinclair Ferguson did this. And so now you have the Belgic Confession, the Heidelberg, uh, and the Canons of Dort, which are in the uh, Dutch uh, Reformed churches in that tradition, and also the Second Helvetic Confession. It's all laid out in parallel columns, and it's also very useful. You'll note in your syllabus that I give you these other references. And so if you have something like this, uh, you're able then as well to uh, compare. I mean, sometimes we'll do that in class as well. So we'll be uh, doing this uh, discussion format. It's a bit more difficult with this arrangement and the size, so I've thought through how to do it. And we'll see if, if God blesses that. If not, we'll try something else. <laughs> but anyway, so. Uh, your reading assignments are indicated at the relevant points in the course outline, so down there on Roman numeral three. Uh, and what I want you to do <coughs> is uh, to read at least four hours a week in the assigned portion of the institutes or other assigned readings. Now, I'm not giving you pages, because we all read at different speeds. Uh, so, um, one of the things that said the objection is this, you actually, Lord willing, will get a, a cursory introduction institutes in this course. And then Dr. McGraw and I have worked out the assigned readings and all the other systematic courses and then probably in ethics others as well. So that you actually read through the institutes more carefully then as well as you work your way through the curriculum. So I want you to read four hours a week. There are uh, questions to guide you in your reading. Are those already in popular? They're supposed to be. Um, and uh, other assigned readings. You'll have some assigned readings toward the end uh, of the uh, semester uh, in Murray on baptism and with the row on church government. You can work ahead on those as well. And so I'm leaving you two hours a week to do a couple of things. One will be to review cannot emphasize too much how important review is. Uh, I learned that if you go back with, within a day of the class and uh, organize your material, and I'm giving it to you in an outline form, it's easier to do, but to organize that material, um, the very review is going to cement it much more carefully in your uh, memory. And then the other part I want you to do is to prepare. So when we come to deal uh, next week with chapters two and three in the Confession of Faith, I would like you really to have thought through uh, those chapters, looked up uh, uh, verses and whatever. Uh, we don't have time to do a lot of exegetical uh, discussion here, but if you have questions, of course, but the more work you do like that, the more you're gonna profit as well. So I'm actually allowing you two hours uh, to do that, review and prepare, and then of course as you start working on the project, as I show you in a moment, you can start ahead on that as well and not be under undue pressure, Lord willing. So that's the reading, uh, and I will simply probably ask you on the exam, um, how many hours a week did you do the extra reading, something like that. Pardon me? I sent the word. Oh, thank you so much. Anybody know Miss Holmes? Yes, I do. Thank you. Thank you. I'm on my way now. All righty, bye bye.
So then in class discussion, I might point you to Calvin. On the other hand, there's something that you read in Calvin that fits well with what we're talking about in the class discussion, then I would want you to, to share that uh, with the rest of us. So of course the reading should be done ahead of time. Now, memorize the assigned catechism questions. And that's 1 through 39, 92, 94, and 96. And you will see them in your class uh, schedule. So for tonight, you would have memorized um, 1 through 3. And next week, uh, 4 through 7. There's about 3 a week. Uh, now, here's how this works. You are to uh, write out the question. You can talk to that from memory. And then write out your answer from memory. Now, you'll notice that the grading is, um, you grade it yourself. And so, I'm not worried about spelling or punctuation, but I do want the exact wording. So one word wrong is, minus, uh, is still an A. Two words wrong, A minus, three, B plus, and you're going down the scale. But the other thing that I'm doing with you is you do not have to hand in the first attempt. As long as everything is in before class for the assignments of that week, let's say you do next week's catechism and you've missed four. So I, I want to do better than that. So you review some more and uh, then do it again. And if you start far enough ahead of time, everyone of you should have it perfect by the time you send it in to Mrs. Holmes. Now that's good for in here. It is good for uh, your examinations. But those of you who are going to be ministers, it's also good for your presbytery exams. Uh, if you can answer from the catechism, uh, nobody can fault you. <laughs> and so uh, we, we, and you actually, Lord willing, again through the four years, we'll go through the catechism three times in this manner, in the various courses. So you are to grade yourself, and you're to send it uh, to Mrs. Holmes, and you have there her email, by 3 p.m. on the day of the class. <clears throat> Don't send them to me. That would be as if she didn't get them, because I'll be in another class. <laughs> um, and on your reading, I'm recommending two hours a week in the institutes, at least, and then two hours but I, you can read far as a week if you, if you wish. Get that six hours of work to do. So, um, Lord willing, at least a third of each class session will be devoted to discussion. And what I'm going to do, we'll see how we do this tonight. I'm just going to start right down the alphabet. And I'll be asking, I'm going to, I used to have the class read the sections, but I think one of the ways that we can cut some, save some time is I'll do the reading and then ask the questions, and I'll go down the alphabet in terms of the different types of questions uh, that I'm going to ask. So, um, the discussion will focus on lesson goals and content of the Confession and Catechisms. Participation, discussion, memorization uh, is about, is, is 15 percent, about five catechism and 10 percent discussion. We'll break that out. Now, those of you who will be listening to this on MP3, Notice the distinct uh, assignment. Since you cannot participate in class discussion, uh, to kind of even the playing field, you must submit a one-page summary of some portion of the answers. Not the entire section you read. You can focus on any section that you would want to, but a one-page uh, praises of that uh, that is related, though, to the topic of the day. So I don't want to hear about Calvin on creation if we're talking about uh, the Trinity. Or other suggested reading as well, if you wanted uh, something else, you just get that approved. So that compensates for missing. So again, if one of you guys out there in Never Never Land uh, are going to have to miss a, uh, a webcast, which I guess they're all there, I don't see them. Says there's 11. Okay. Um, then this is what you would do for the one you missed. You would let me know ahead of time. I'm not going to be online. And by 3 o'clock, well, actually, preferably a little earlier, 
but no, that's fine. By three o'clock the day of the class, then send that to me. So uh, at the bottom of requirements, you'll see my email. And it's not my normal email. It's not my GPTS email. It's joseph.piper at gmail.com. And I just use this for classes, academic stuff. If it came to my other account, it gets lost. And I get 50 or 60 emails a day. Um, so this way, I don't lose your assignment or your question that you send uh, to me. Uh, so uh, MP3 students use that address, one page summary by three o'clock the day of the class. Then the really fun assignment, and I, I wrestled with the course and tried different things, and this worked well last year, to prepare an outline and a lesson plan on an assigned chapter of the confession. Uh, and I'm going to give you a couple of models. And actually, it was two ladies, two MAs. Well, actually, Mrs. Holmes and Hannah de Zavedo, uh did really excellent work. So that way, I didn't have models in the past. I had models for outlines, but not for the lesson plan. So here we're getting to the nuts and bolts now. How can I work this out? And then, <clears throat> well, we've got 33 people. So we've uh, pretty much covered the waterfront. You sh we share these, and then in a Sunday school or adult class or high school, whatever, you've got, not that you stick to everybody's saying, but at least you'll have a lot of work there done for you as well down the road. So that's the, uh, so you'll have two exams uh, covering, it says cover the entire course, but it's not cumulative. You'll have the first half of the material, and then you'll have the second half of the material. Uh, each exam is 25%. You must have a passing examination on both exams and on your paper uh, in order to pass the course, though. So don't really do well in the midterm and think, well, I don't have to worry about the final. Well, you do have to worry about the final. If you don't pass the final, you don't pass the course. And that's. Uh, 50% of your grade then. So, any questions about the assignments? You been clear? Real quick, with uh, sending the question to Mrs. Holmes, is it just the grade that we got, or are we actually sending her the question? That no, we're send her the question. So, in other words, you type that out, check it on your typed thing, whichever part you missed still, and then, thank you, good question. But, so, we type it in Word, can we like highlight in red the ones where we were wrong, or, or how do we mark it that? Yeah, you can yeah, highlight, highlight in red. That's a good way to do it. To ask her what they do. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I think probably underline it or highlight it, and then that right out beside it, miss three, okay. something like that. I know they've always. Been, because you're grading yourself. You you're grading yourself, so she doesn't have the yes. And when you speak, tell me who you are. And move your lips. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. Uh, this is David Melton over here in, in the corner, I guess. Um, this was going back to when you were looking at the webcams. A couple of us disconnected our webcams because there's been a bandwidth issue and the screen's really fuzzy and we're not able to see you or the screen but if everybody disconnects their webcam it becomes a little bit more clear so i just wanted to, to let you know i didn't know if you were aware or not no i'm not in the last course we didn't have really this many people and they said the screens were fuzzy though do you mind sending an email please to kevin yesterday about that yes sir thank you because i will not remember yeah, that's, uh, I've got this new system. It's supposed to handle uh, actually 151 max. So surely 11 shouldn't be blowing the system, <laughs> should it? Uh, let me uh, just make sure I'm working on names here. So that is, uh, that was Jonathan, right? I think that I'm David Milton. Who? David Milton. David Milton. Oh. Yes, sir, David Milton. David Milton. Yeah, there's David Milton. Okay. Thank you, David. All right. Some 
simple attendance and class rules. We expect you to attend all classes when an unexcused absence will result in the grade being awarded one letter, two, two letters, three failure. Request for excuse to be made by phone, text, or email. If email or text is not acknowledged, then call the school office, Mrs. Holmes. If because of an emergency you're unable to contact me before class, let me know as soon as possible the nature of the emergency. You may not be on the internet or the web during class unless I ask you to look up something. Um, if some of you have got your Bibles on there or whatever, um, then obviously you have to be on there. But don't wander off that page. So I've already said, if you need to miss a class, then you will do that other assignment. You must have permission. Um, unapproved late assignments, that will be your paper, uh, will receive automatic F. Approved late assignments will be penalized according to school regulations or in the student handbook. Office hours, Tuesdays 9 to 1, and Wednesdays 12 to 4, and upon request other times, make appointments with Mrs. Holmes. But in those times, 9 to 1 and 12 to 4, um, I might at times be out for lunch, but if I'm there, just feel free as well to drop in and hang out a while. Or we might go sit out in the patio in the back and do something else while we hang out. <laughs> All right. Distant student emails will be answered, Lord willing, the week they are received. And then my phone number is there, and again, my email is there for you. Any questions thus far? Actually, yes. You're going back to the uh, the outline assignment. Um, when will we be assigned which uh, which chapter? Thank you. I was going to tell you that. Um, you may queue up. Whoever gets to her first, <laughs> um, you probably should give Miss Holmes your top three choices. But it's the first come, first serve, and the bird gets the worm. Is that right? Or the the <laughs> Maybe the apple gets the worm. <laughs> anyway, so yes. Uh, so don't waste any time on that one. Although, I mean, and if you just want to send her an email, I'd like to do this one, and these are my top three. Uh, that's fine. And only if we get blocked out through three, we go to four. But, uh, and you've got an advantage <coughs> over all those MP3 students that are just working out there in the dark <laughs> world. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And that's a chapter from Calvin's Institute. No, I'm sorry. It's a chapter in the Confession. Okay. Thank you for asking. You might have said it. For asking that. I hope I did, but it's quite possible it's not there. No, it's there. And I read it. Um, chapter of Confession. It's in the, um, the one that she just sent. Okay. The one that it's not in the other one? So that's, that's not in the right syllabus, and we have replaced this thing yeah, I printed, three I printed it out and I have times. <laughs> Popular is about really to, it's really a nice tool, but um, no, because somebody, Josh, I think, wrote me that the dates were wrong, and I found out that, that the, the syllabus I sent was not the syllabus that got posted. Well, that sounds again, if this is the case, uh, because, as you see, 219 student, this is what I sent. It's probably, probably some of us downloaded the old one. Before. Too early, maybe? Okay. Yeah, maybe no, that's No, I just it. did it. I mean, the one I just printed was just yesterday. Oh, okay. Oh. Well, we'll send to that as well. All right, there's some, uh, some suggested books. Uh, of course, the harmony is required. Institutes required, you use them a lot. Then uh, also required John Murray on baptism and Thomas Witherow, Apostolic Church. I highly recommend, although it's misspelled, the Presbyterian Standards by Francis B. That's a publication of the seminary. We've got them very inexpensively, and I really like it. It's quite useful. It's, uh, He's, 
his harmony follows, I think it follows the Shorter Catechism. So it's a different approach. Uh, but it's quite useful. So for some of you other reading, then these are, you can read in Beatty, you can read in Van Dyck's Horn then, Confessing Faith is another. So those will be the two in addition to Calvin um, for your four hours a week. It'll be at least two hours a week in Calvin. All four if you want to. Uh, and then Witherow and Murray will be required at the appropriate place in the course. Now, the uh, course outline uh, schedule, let's, let's uh, dip right in now and deal with one problem that we have, and that is on December 3rd, uh, I just have to go to London. We can go in. I take the whole class. It's the Westminster Conference. Uh, yeah. Given a paper on Perkins, but anyway, um, it starts on the third. <laughs> and if I don't fly on the Lord's Day, I actually have to leave Friday. Uh, so I get in on Saturday. And uh, as I said, it's a real sacrifice because I'm going to miss the Auburn Alabama game <laughs> and the SEC championship game. So you know, this is this, I'm, I'm sacrificing to do this. But seriously, we need to uh, work out a makeup class time. Uh, and so I'm going to start with these people because they're here. You guys can do it MP3 if you have to. But uh, is there a Friday afternoon or Monday afternoon uh, in which you don't work and you don't have a class? Yeah. Yeah? Friday works for me. Fridays? You guys, Fridays? Just be one time, and I will uh, do it about maybe right after uh, midterms. Okay, I'll send a couple of dates and work on that thing. Very good. You made it easy for me. Thank you. So then in the uh, course schedule, we'll see what we'll be dealing with that class period in the confession catechisms. So that's the first three things, and then try to use consistently the WCF, LC, and SC, and the institutes, and your memorization. So that's always the first sentence. And then there's suggested in the other standards. So if you wanted to look at the bells at uh, articles 2 to 7 for today, Heidelberg Catechism, questions 19 to 20, Dort, head 1, article 3, head 2, article 5, heads 3 and 4, articles 8 and 17, and then our head 5, article 14. So that just gives you then, so if you, you, know, you don't need the harmony, I've done the work for you, and so if you simply got a, a little paperback copy of the Three Forms of Unity, the Psalter Hymnal, which I highly recommend, has, the, uh, has them in the back as well as Westminster Standards. My uh, book on discipleship, uh, studies in the confession, have them in the back. It doesn't have the second alphabetic, though, but it has the other six in the back as well. So it would be well worth your while to read those. That's not going to take you 10 or 15 minutes, and you can get that breadth. All right. Any other questions? So fall break is the 8th. The midterm then will be the Tuesday after fall break. And then um, rest half of the course. OK, so rest of our time tonight is pretty good. We want to look at the historical background of the assembly, a little bit on the use of uh, Confessions, why make confessions, and then chapter one. Um, so let's start with just a very brief exegetical background for creeds and their use. If you're interested, uh, I have a, a paper on this. It's supposed to be published actually by Liberty University in a journal from the conference, uh, Reformation Conference. And I, I didn't think they'd accept the paper in the first place. 
So I said the exegetical basis of it was Reformation Conference for creeds and confessions. They accepted it. And then they asked me if they could publish it in the journal from the uh, conference. So we were thankful for that. We're still waiting for it to come. But uh, I can send you that copy of that if you just if you want that. Just send a note to Miss Holmes, or I can just actually have her put it in Populi for everybody because I'm not going to have take time tonight to touch on much of this right now. But in um, 2 Timothy 1, and you remember this is Paul's last will and testament. He's preparing Timothy now for this departure from Paul. Uh, and what we have, particularly it seems running through 2 Timothy, is a call to steadfastness to endure repeated in many different ways. But here in chapter 1, he says, uh, after he's asserted his own confidence uh, in what God has revealed to him. Verse 13, retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Now, some of the important words here are standard of sound words. The Greek word for standard is the word for a blueprint, a pattern that was to be followed. And Paul uses this expression of sound words uh, throughout the pastoral epistles to refer to uh, wholesome, true doctrine. But what is a standard of sound words? So this is not the scriptures, because at this point the letters are sitting around in various churches as he writes this last letter. They've not been greatly distributed at this point, particularly if you go from Asia to Europe or back to Palestine or whatever, but, um, or Rome. Uh, but this is the summary of apostolic teaching. It is, in fact, a creedal summary. Uh, and that is how we should understand this, because there was nothing else that they would have had at this point. Um, and notice then in verse 14, it's called the treasure with which you have been entrusted, which has been entrusted to you. And this word uh, entrusted is then the work for uh, tradition. And you see there was an apostolic tradition. Not all tradition is bad. Roman Catholic traditions that come out of the head of popes and whatever uh, aren't good. Traditions that we get locked into our churches, for which there's no biblical basis, uh, are fine as long as they're pastly useful, but we don't just hang on to them because they're traditions. Uh, but apostolic tradition is, again, another word, and Paul will talk about holding fast to the tradition. Here, treasure the tradition. So there was a, this body of truth, this apostolic tradition that was being passed out amongst the believers uh, following biblical patterns. So in Deuteronomy chapter 6, that's the first formal confession that we have in the Bible. And to this day, it's used in the synagogue. It's the Shema. Hear, O Israel. Of course, the Shema is the first word of that Hebrew word for hear. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with heart, mind, soul, and strength. So that c confession, hear, the Lord our God is one. Um, that has remained the confession of monotheism uh, throughout the centuries. And it can be as much our confession as it was theirs. Uh, Dr. Knight will argue that the, what, the five faithful sayings that Paul has in the pastoral epistles were actually all little creedal statements. Uh, and then, uh, of course, we've got that delightful statement in 1st Timothy chapter 3 by common confession that's not talking about a confession but confessedly true by common confession great is the mystery of godliness and then notice he's quoting something here he was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit seen by angels proclaimed among the nations believed on in the world taken up in glory and so here you have this is be one of those traditions one of those apostolic words that Paul passed on to the church and so with the commandment that we have, seen against the backdrop of the use of, of confessions, creeds uh, in uh, the Bible, 
uh, we recognize then there is a biblical warrant uh, for making uh, creeds and confessions. Now let's stop and define our terms. The creed is the very succinct a summary of truth, such as the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. Uh, Apostles' Creed was basically the baptismal confession. It developed a bit, it wasn't by the Apostles, it was a summary of apostolic truth, uh, but um, it reached its present form probably maybe in the eighth century or whatever with the addition of Descended into Hell, uh, which we'll talk about later in the, in the semester. Uh, the Nicene Creed, the creeds were written then either as baptismal formulas or creeds written to address particular errors in the church. Confessions are the more formal uh, doctrinal statement of a group of Christians. And so the Lutherans have their Augsburg, uh, the Reformed have the uh, Belgic, the Swiss, the Second Helvetic, and we have Westminster. Uh, and that's a, a, a much, much more detailed, systematic development of truth. And then uh, catechisms are the truth then put into the pedagogical format of questions and answers. It's very interesting, the use of catechisms in the history of the church, and then particularly uh, how the uh, reform took advantage of catechetical instruction and the Lutherans as well. So both Calvin and Luther uh, wrote catechisms for the instruction of the children. So that's what we mean by, by creeds. I use creeds to summarize uh, all, uh, all the other. Now, uh, the first purpose of creeds is for communion. By communion, I mean unity. The Bible asks the question, if two do not agree, how can they walk together? This is why in, again, the German and Dutch reform tradition, they call their confessional standards the three forms of unity. Because we are agreed that this is what the Bible teaches. Now, the creed is not at the level of the Bible. In fact, we'll see this in Westminster even this evening by God's grace, that the creed is under the Bible. But what we're saying is that um, I believe that this summarizes the teaching of the Bible. We corporately believe this summarizes the teaching of the Bible. And thus we give a statement to the world, we give a unified statement, and we dwell together in unity. In America and the West in these days, the church is a voluntary institution. Nobody compels you into a particular denominations, denomination and um, you're not compelled then to hold to one doctrine or another. And if you want to leave, you may leave if you do so in a proper manner. Now, in the Reformed tradition, all church members to some degree, there's a good bit of, of a flex room there I gather in more modern times, uh, all members subscribe to the confession, the three forms of unity. Uh, Presbyterianism, and, and Samuel Miller used it as the uh, doctrine of Presbyterian liberty, recognizing that we don't all come to truth at the, at the same level at the same time. And so what we have required for church membership is a credible profession of faith. Now that's more than I believe in Jesus. A person's reading the Bible, they've got basic Apostle Creed Orthodox doctrines and does not need blatant practice of sin in their lives. But all office bearers in our Presbyterian churches are to hold to um, the confession of faith and the catechisms. So it's for the purpose of unity. Now, I'll, I hadn't planned to do it this way, but let's simply talk about this issue now of subscription. You've heard the term? Subscription uh, used to be a very simple thing. Uh, in the Adopting Act, back in the uh, what, 1729, uh, the first synod of, of the colonies uh, adopted the Westminster Standards as their confession of faith. And they allowed some scruples, we'll talk about that difference in a moment. 
But everybody that signed that document was basically saying, um, I, this is my confession of faith. And so if you remember, the vow that we took at graduation is that it is the system of truth taught in Scripture. Now that doesn't mean that in it you could kind of make your own system. What those words have historically meant is that I believe that this is a, a biblically faithful, organized representation of what the Bible teaches in all of these doctrines. That's been the historic approach to subscription. I think in the paper I'll send you, I'll send you another one as well. I've got uh, an article on subscription as well. Because it's a very important issue today. Because So how many of you are in the uh, Presbyterian Church in America? You're going to be, aren't you, David? Okay. All right. So a few years ago, we uh, had adopted, it was voted on, by the majority, what they call good faith subscription. There's nothing good or faithful about good faith subscription. It is a very typical progressive use of language that you would also find uh, political liberals using as well. So what good faith subscription has done is said that my vow doesn't mean I hold all the doctrines. Uh, this way I, can, I don't have to lie. I can, I can in good conscience say that this is my confession as I have defined it. So it's no longer the confession that the church has defined that says is our corporate witness to the world. It's my confession. I just have to get my presbytery to accept it. So we then have four levels. We have no exceptions. We have minor semantic exceptions. We have more serious exceptions, but they don't strike at the vitals of uh, the confession. And then we have those exceptions that strike at the vitals. But who makes that decision? Each individual presbytery. I'm still arguing in Calvary Presbytery that pictorial images of Christ strike at the vitals because they deny the hypostatic union. It's a much serious Christological issue there. Now, can't get them to see it yet, but I don't give up. Uh, one day, maybe Calvary Presbyterian, which is one of the most conservative Presbyterians in the denomination, and thank God for that. Um, one day we might adopt that, but then a guy wants to transfer in from a Presbytery that only found it a matter of of um, semantics, or well, yeah, it's a serious exception, but it doesn't strike the vitals, and you got a conflict. The relativism spills over then the realism of scripture as well. If words don't have any kind of objective meaning, it's like the uh, time at, at the General Assembly when the Creation Committee reported and there was, at the end of the day, a motion was made that we had day age, analogical framework, and six day creation. All four are consistent with the language of the standards. What's well, absurd? You might say, I don't believe the standards, but you can't say all four are consistent with God made all things by the word of his power in the space of six days and all very good. Uh, so that relativism is, is creeping in as well. So in contrast, we would hold to full subscription, not good faith subscription. And uh, by full subscription, what we're saying is that when I take my vow, I'm saying that I believe every doctrine that's in the Confession of Faith. Now, it doesn't mean I have to hold to how that doctrine is expressed or some uh, minor aspect of the doctrine itself. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, Dr. Knight, um, bless his heart, is pre-mill, historic pre-mill. I never can fathom it, but he is. He's also a strict subscriptionist. So this is what we would call a scruple. That he believes all the confession says about the second coming, except he believes a little more <laughs> involved in the second coming than what's there. And uh, that was allowed. Or he, exegetically, he would say that uh, the doxology in the Lord's Prayer is not in Matthew's version of the Lord's Prayer. It's, a, it's true, it's other places in Scripture, but it's not there. So he would then scruple the addition of that in the Catechism's exposition of the Lord's Prayer. Or 
one that we often talk about is the matter of exclusive psalmody. I would say if, I don't think the confession does require exclusive psalmody, but if it did, I would scruple that. I believe in the regular principle of worship. I believe we may only sing psalms and hymns that are consistent with the psalms and scripture. But if the confession required that, I would just tell the press. So that's the kind of thing I mean by scruple. And that's the position of the seminary for faculty and board. Uh, but it's not any position we require of any student. So I think all of you already know that. You don't have to um, accept uh, many of the views of the Westminster Standards to graduate here and do well. Of course, again, basic Christianity. If you you know, the Bible is the Word of God or the Trinity or things like that, justification, salvation by faith, the basic doctrines. But Presbyterianism, our regular principle of worship, or Sabbath, you know, we do our best to convince you creation. Um, but you're not required to um, hold those positions. We'll mock you and <laughs> post a picture on the wall, but uh, uh, it won't affect your grade. <laughs> It'll help me. <laughs> and they keep changing up there. It's great, you know. You just run them through ever so often. Again, uh, this is gonna be so hard. I think every one of you should send me a photograph with your name. Okay? Can you handle that? Or does the registrar already have that? She does. Did y'all submit pictures? Yeah, student ID. They don't have student IDs. Anyway, yeah, this is, uh, I'm praying for you, but I don't know who I'm, for whom I'm praying. <laughs> All right. So, now that's one use. Any, any questions about subscription? Are you clear on this? And I will send the paper. Excuse me, Dr. Parpa. Uh, this is David Melton. Hey, David. <clears throat> I got you down. <laughs> Until next week. Uh, uh, quick question. Um, you were covering the case of this as far as the standards position on exclusive psalmody. Is there, are there any good papers that you know of that cover the historical view of the divines as far as um, what they believed uh, in the Jerusalem chamber? Uh, there are bibliographies which I'm trying to get get some sent to me. I've been told by two different people of the bibliographies. I do know that a uh, number of the Westminster divines did sing hymns, even some of the Scots. Uh, there were hymns in some of the early Scottish Psalters. Uh, Manton, in the, his commentary on James 5, says that Salmos does not refer exclusively to the Psalms. What he says is, I would prefer to sing Psalms exclusively. But he doesn't state it as a mandatory requirement. So that's one, one place that comes to mind right off. That's something I'm trying to work on, so. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, David. Thank you for the question. And we'll come back to that when we get to worship. All right, now some other uses of creeds, though, that are very pastoral as well as for unity. Uh, one is for interpretation. And Calvin makes this point in the uh, either his confession or his uh, catechism, that what we have in the creed then is uh, the analogy of faith, which we'll talk about in, in a little while today, but you compare scripture with scripture. So uh, a person is reading the Bible and they get to uh, 1 Samuel uh, chapter was it 15 or 17, where God says that I regret having made Saul king. So, did God change his mind? If the person knows their catechism, that God himself is unchangeable and God's decree is the eternal purpose according to the counsel of his will or by his foreordaining whatsoever comes to pass, they'll say, well, I, I don't know how to answer this, but no, God didn't change his mind. So that's just an example of how um, creeds can be useful. Get back up to one more thing. I'm trying to rush through this, and this happens, I rush through this. 
one of the very practical, two very practical arguments for confessions, because there's a large group of people saying no, no creed but the Bible. Uh, Dabney points this out. Every time a preacher goes in the pulpit and declares, thus says the Lord, he has expressed a creed. He's not just reading the Bible, is he? At least, let's hope not. Maybe they'd be better off in lots of places if that's all he did. But uh, no, he's giving you an interpretation, his interpretation of that passage of scripture, his creed. Now would you rather have a church agreed upon creed that he's agreed to, or the tyranny of the individual? And the same is true when we're talking about interpretation with Bible translations, another place that people express creedal commitments for Bible translations. Two examples. You will learn often that the New American Standard is my standard, preferred standard, uh, Bible translation. But it was put together by uh, a Baptist. Maybe some of you are Baptists. I think Mr. Freitag's a Baptist, and that's good. But um, two places where their theology uh, influenced their uh, translation. One is in the unclean, uh, the cleansing of things by baptism in Matthew chapter 15. All the text, the text that the New Mink Standard always uses and defers to, if you looked in the critical apparatus, includes couches. But because they're operating from a, a position that baptism all, always means immersed, then they had to make a choice to leave out their preferred text in that case. A loon would be in the baptism of the Philippian jailer and his family, where the Greek is very clear. I just went back reading through Acts again and examined it, that uh, uh, they translated something to the effect that, uh, I'll just tell you how they translated it. Verse 34, he brought them into his house, he set food before them, and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. Um, and the rejoicing greatly is what refers to uh, the whole household. Uh, the part that was quite clear, it uh, has to be referring to the whole household. But they wanted to say that everybody that baptized believed. So at that point, they make a grammatically improper uh, translation of the New Testament. It's not, here it's not a textual issue. It's actually uh, uh, how you're going to properly translate a participle and to what it relates. So um, we all operate on these theological presuppositions. We understand that. None of us are infallible. But again, it's very useful to be guided by agreed upon uh, statement of faith. So interpretation then, it's useful, and then communication. Um, Dr. Pickle, what was the Matthew 15 that you said? It was about the cleansing of the uh, pots and pans and furniture. furniture. The tradition of the uh, They do not wash their hands. Uh, well, maybe it's Mark 7 then. They're, they're parallels. Yeah, I'm sorry. Let's look at Mark 7. Yeah. So, uh, Verse 2, the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the traditions of the elders. And they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. And there you'll see the footnote uh, is uh, they're baptizing themselves. That's the Greek word. And then there are many other things which they receive 
in order to observe, such as the baptizing of cups and pitchers and copper pots. And the, the better text have couches. And what's really interesting here is that I like New American Standard because when it does take an alternate textual reading, nine times I tend to give you a footnote that some text will say this or that, or will actually include what the others say, and they say that those ancient texts don't have this. That's what they do with John 8 or the end of Long and end of Mark. So, yeah, that's uh, just a place where you, you, our theology is always going to be doing this. I mean, that's who we are. We have presuppositions, and, but the creeds help us. And, and then communication. Warfield gives the story of D.L. Moody. He was, I think, in Chicago, and a young man had come for an interview after he heard him preach, and uh, he was in the home of a Presbyterian elder, and uh, his host, and so the young man is asking Spurgeon, what do you Christians mean by prayer? And at that very moment, the, uh, the man's daughter, who was 10 or 11, 12, was coming down the stairs. And her, I don't remember her name, her dad says, Alice, what is prayer? And she folded her hands and began to recite the uh, answer in the Shorty Catechism what prayer is. And so the immediately you got a communication, a, a succinct communication of truth. That's one of the beauties of catechism, is that it, it's, it's the matrix for our thinking. It just so aptly states in usually a brevity of words, in the short of catechism, uh, truth. And so it's great for uh, communicating uh, truth to people. Um, and then also connected with that, then with the defense of the faith. And I use the example. So a um, Jehovah's Witness comes to your house and you're talking and, um, and do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Well, of course we do. Well, then you go to what the confession says about the Son. And now do you believe this about Jesus as the Son of God? No. So it's a great way to defend the faith as well, even for people who are not as adept personally of dealing with uh, people, cults and like that. They know their catechism. They've got a tool at hand to uh, help them out at that point. So that's a very brief uh, survey of the scriptural basis and some of the uses and subscription with respect to uh, the creed. Now we want to go on and uh, look um, at the historical background, and I want to finish this, if possible, in 20 minutes. So we'll go rapidly. I do have a PowerPoint. It's not as exact. them if I hit X up there? There we go. All right. So the history of the Westminster Standards, which actually, in fact, include the Confession of Faith, Larger and Shorter Catechism, Directory of Worship, and the form of uh, government. Uh, received their name from uh, Westminster Abbey, uh, which these are pictures of Westminster Abbey. It's right across the street from the House of Parliament. Houses of Parliament. And within Westminster Abbey, one of the uh, meeting rooms um, was called the Jerusalem Chamber because there was an English king who was ready to go on 
a crusade to uh, Jerusalem. Uh, he was taken ill. His body was taken into the chamber. That's where he died. And so he didn't get to Jerusalem physically, so they named it the New Jerusalem Chamber. So the picture you'll see, for example, down in the boardroom or in my uh, study, many of you have seen that picture, they've got it hanging there at, uh, at Woodruff Road, amongst other places, is the Jerusalem Chamber. Now, Presbyterians all love this picture, but a lot of folks don't realize the people in that picture are all the independents that were at the assembly. <laughs> it's not the Presbyterians who were at the assembly. Now, I've got another little chart down there that, that shows, identifies the people for you. So that's where the Westminster Confession of Faith and Catechisms get their name, Westminster Abbey, Jerusalem Chamber. If you're going to England, if you just arrange ahead of time, you can usually get a private tour. You can't just go on the Abbey tour and get in there. But if you uh, call ahead of time, last time we took friends, it was very interesting because we talked to one of the burgers or whatever, had an appointment, called him, he met us at the back door, we went straight in, he gave us the tour. He says, well, I got time. Let me just show you the rest of it. So we didn't have to pay all the big bucks either uh, for the tour of Westminster Abbey. All of us were at sea, but particularly uh, the, the uh, chamber. Now, the background of the Westminster Assembly is, in fact, the development of English Puritanism, which took place uh, in its development in four stages. So Henry VIII, who was king from 1509 to 1547, um, made himself the head of the church and replaced the pope. Now, later on, some of his decisions were probably hormonal. But this decision was not. He really, as all the Westminster divines believe, uh, and all the English reformers believed, that he was sinning and being married to his, uh, the widow of his brother. And that has been, the, I don't agree with that, but the majority of reform writers you read, ancient or modern, will agree with that. And so he was convinced, and see, you know, he's just two generations removed from the War of Roses that had England split in half for decades. And so the Tudors come to the throne, his father dies, he's king, and his, because his brother died, and so he's married to his brother's widow, and she's childless. And all he can think of is, again, the havoc of War of Roses. So he then consulted, and so he consulted with the English reformers, and they all agreed that it was a sin for him to be married to his brother's widow. No, yes. At which point, the Pope will do anything for money then and now. He asked for an annulment, or for it to be declared invalid, and the Pope wouldn't do it, only because of political things. Um, the Queen was related, of course, to uh, the nobility of Spain, and and um, Emperor was also related to her, and so he denied that. So at that point is when Henry then declared himself to be the supreme head of the church over against the pope, which of course made the daughter of that union, Mary, illegitimate and very bitter. Um, now, providentially, Henry was kind of up and down, and maybe a part of that was who was around him. The earlier Cromwell, um, I think, was pretty much a, at least in a good many ways, a supporter of the, of the reform. So uh, Cramer was the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, and others at the university. And then there'd be some persecution, and then there would be some freedom. But it was enough room in God's providence for these men to develop. Tyndall got the New Testament translated, I think, while he was still at Cambridge. Then he had to start fleeing for his life as things were up and down. And he's an outlaw on the continent, uh, translating the Hebrew uh, Bible into English, because uh, they were convinced that the Bible should be language to the people. So Henry left a, a foundation for a church to reform. And Edward VI had had uh, reformed tutors. 
So he comes to the throne in 1547 and immediately institutes Reformation with the uh, uh, revised Book of Common Prayer and the 39 articles were then changed to 42 articles. Um, moving along a pace, but he was only king for five years. I think he died of consumption. It's one of the history's uh, beautiful way to look at providence. Now, what's God doing? Here, Ref Reformation has begun. Here is a young man committed to carrying it through, and he dies. And the bitter sister, step no half sister, comes to the throne. That's why he didn't have a male. No, that's right, this is the daughter of, yeah, I didn't have a male heir, I guess is what I'm saying. So, she immediately wants to bring the church all the way back under the Pope. She's married to uh, Philip, and then she begins to persecute the uh, reformers. Now, why? Well, there's a chase in the church, but it's also the fact that hundreds of these men then went to Geneva and Zurich where they had a taste of what the Reformed Church was like. So when she died in five years, God accomplished his purpose, he brings Elizabeth to the throne. Now what's interesting is, Mary kind of paved the way. I mean, Henry was afraid that a female monarch would not be able to hold the country together, but uh, uh, Mary uh, was accepted as queen. And uh, so Elizabeth now, who was also considered by the Roman Catholics to be illegitimate, she comes to the throne, and she is a Protestant, at least her Puritan contemporaries, many consider her to be truly converted. I know you get all this stuff about affairs and everything, and you know, how much of that's Hollywood and, and whatever. I just read what Perkins had to say about her, and it was quite remarkable in terms of uh, thanking God for a Christian queen. But the problem with Mary and with Elizabeth was, and let me also make sure you keep straight Mary of Tudor and Mary, Queen of Scots, because people invariably mix up the two. That's why we have here Mary Tudor. She was the Tudor household. She was the uh, daughter of Henry VIII. Mary, Queen of Scots, was a niece of Henry VIII, a descendant of a sister of his that had been married to James King of Scotland. So she was in a line of succession to the throne. And maybe even when Elizabeth comes to the throne, she had some, uh, some claim to the throne at that, at that point. Uh, but uh, Elizabeth was uh, chosen Mary, Queen of Scots. So Mary Tudor is Bloody Mary. Mary, Queen of Scots, is the one that spent 20 years trying to overthrow her cousin and was eventually executed because of her plans of a revolt. So, but with Elizabeth, put yourself Elizabeth's shoes. She was a, a female monarch. She had a country that had been half Roman Catholic, half English Catholic, Protestant, Roman Catholic. A great majority of people probably had converted at this point very weak in their faith. She had political opposition from the Roman church and what was the Romanists that were in England. Uh, her own life would often be in danger. Um, and so, although she was a Protestant, she developed the uh, via media, the middle way, and would have been much more the kind of the direction of the Lutheran conservative reformation than the Calvin, Geneva, more radical, well, another radical, uh, biblical reformation. So she uh, didn't make life easy uh, for these men who come rushing back from the continent, bubbling over with all these ideas, examples of, of uh, what a, a reformed church looks like and uh, she is afraid to let the country go that direction. And so she gets, for the most part, bishops who are yes men. Some stood up for like Grindall. Uh, he opposed her when she tried to stifle preaching and he got under a 
permanent house arrest for that reason. Uh, but most of those early bishops were all Calvinistic in their doctrine. And that's something else we need to understand. They weren't Arminian. Arminianism happens under James. Uh, they, their soteriology was Calvinistic. Uh, but they wanted to, they were committed to an episcopacy, which is more compatible with monarchy than Presbyterianism. And, um, but, uh, and they would vary. Some were much more of a Calvinistic tendency in church life and worship, and they would not bother the Puritan men in their diocese. Uh, others would be much more uh, avid. Two, two things she passed in 1558, the uh, doctrine of supremacy, so it took over from her father, that she was the head of the church, but then she compromised with the Puritans, and she said, only in affairs of state. Well, she qualified it in order to, you know, make them a little happier. And then the, uh, but the other and most difficult thing was this, uh, I just forgot the word, the required prayer book use and the vestments, uh, act of supremacy, act of uniformity. And so, she wanted a uniform church again because recognizing that she's in the middle way and, and da in danger. And so uh, they, the, the Puritan men fought her at every level with pamphlets and take some petitions to Parliament, but it was the vestment controversy on having to wear not the preaching robe, but different colored uh, gowns and ribbons and stoles and stuff for liturgical seasons. Well, they lost that. They lost uh, on the uh, Book of Common Prayer. Uh, they lost on trying to get Presbyterianism in. There was quite a proto-Presbyterian movement in her days. Uh, and they actually had uh, secret Presbyterians and synods. And really what we have in the Westminster uh, form of government, which is the weakest thing out of the assembly because of the independence, is the early books that these men, though, had written to try to introduce Presbyterianism. So uh, when she died in 1603, she never married. And so now, uh, the, a descendant of the James of Scotland uh, was the next in line, not a little bit like Mary, but in fact, Mary's son. Now he was James the sixth of Scotland. He um, was James the first in England. Now, how do you go from being a sixth to a first? Come on, you just Wait, are you asking? Oh, oh, that, oh that, was that was a question. So, how? How do you go from being the sixth to the first? Yeah. There was no James before him, but he was the first. King. Well, how was he the sixth then? Scotland, okay, very good. They, they so he was the sixth James that was the king of Scotland. But there had been no other James that was the king of England, so now he becomes James the first of England. Now, Knox and others have been this man's mentors. You can imagine the Presbyterians were dancing a jig uh, when James the first comes to the throne. But the Stuarts, and that's what he's the first of, um, the Stuarts had a very high view of themselves and the divine right of the king. And they were going to do anything to protect not just the monarchy, but the particular monarch at the time. And so he comes to the throne in 1603, and he then uh, is king for some 22 years. When he came, the Puritans met with him, hoping that now we would get some uh, break in these things, and um, they got nothing. They met at Windsor Castle, and they got nothing but a new authorized version. It's called the authorized version because the king, not the church, authorized. That's, I get tickled at all these people that think this authorized version is just about to come down from heaven. It's authorized. Who authorized it? A hater of the Puritans. Why did they authorize it? Because the Bible of the day amongst them was the Geneva Bible, written by Knox and uh, the English and Scottish exiles in Geneva, and it was the first study Bible. So it has notes that are all reformed. And so 
he was doing nobody a favor to get a new Bible. He wanted to get rid of the Geneva Bible. Now it's a great translation. And he didn't just have Anglicans. He had broad, best scholars at that time uh, in the church to do the translation. It's a wonderful translation. But it's nice to know from history why it came into being and who authorized it. It wasn't the church. I'm all for a church having an authorized version. Uh, I think that's useful if, if churches would do that kind of thing. But this was authorized by the king. That's what they got out of him at the time. Now again, uh, throughout his reign, uh, things were up and down, but Arminianism was developing. He also himself um, did some uh, pretty bad things. He, um, oh, it was not Windsor, it was Hampton Court where they uh, um, did that. He, um, under Archbishop Whitcliffe, they passed 39 articles in 1605 that would have driven hundreds of Puritan preachers out of the church. 300 were suspended, but he did compromise, and eventually about 100 were deprived of their living. A lot of them at that time would have gone over to uh, Amsterdam. And he began to develop at this point two different things in addition to Presbyterianism. You got congregationalism and independency. Now, what's the difference in England? The congregationalists still believed in a state church. They were Anglicans, and they wanted the state church to be governed congregationally. The independents had come to the point that they should have no uh, state church and no real connectionalism. And many of them, of uh, the uh, independents, the separatists, uh, they went to uh, Holland, Netherlands, and that was the group that formed the Plymouth Colony, and then the ones that formed Salem, uh, they would have been the Congregationalists. So they actually had both brands of independence over in the colonies as well. But that developed under um, James, and then uh, Arminianism begins to spread, and the Book of Sports which was a book designed to promote sports on the Lord's Day to <coughs> counteract um, the Puritan uh, emphasis on the Sabbath. Now James was himself a defender again of Calvinist soteriology. Uh, he sent men to Dort and there's some uh, letters uh, between him and the men at Dort, stuff that he wanted them to press for and send to Dort. And so he was not sympathetic at that point to Arminianism, but uh, he did not like the strictness of the Puritan piety. So he died in 1625, and this comes now to the tension that moves to the Westminster Assembly. Charles I comes to the throne. He is high church, uh, as high as you can get in the Anglican church in terms of Roman Catholic views. His wife was a Roman Catholic, and he begins to move the church now towards Roman Catholicism, the thing that so many feared. His henchman was uh, Archbishop Laud. Laud was uh, a very powerful man. Uh, he uh, was committed to the high church party. He led it. He was privy counselor, which is the king's private best counselor in 1628. 1629, the Bishop of London, which effectively was more powerful than the Bishop of Canterbury, who was over the whole area. But he did become Bishop of Canterbury in 1633. Uh, he enforced the policies. He started uh, uh, Archepiscopal Visitation. Uh, I probably should slow down and at least make sure you understand the Anglican form of government. Does everybody understand that? I use these terms and I learned it's best not to assume things. I'm like, this thing doesn't work. The pen is not working. Maybe I do that, it will work. Go back here. All right. Let's try it again. Nope, doesn't work. So, picture this in your mind. Episcopal government is top down. So it's what you have in Roman Catholicism. So England was divided into two church, ecclesiastical provinces, Canterbury and York, country just about divided in half. Canterbury is the 
chief amongst equal because it was the center of the development of Roman Catholic Christianity uh, in the British Isles. So the Archbishop of Canterbury is top dog, and the Archbishop of York is second top dog. Now in each province, there are a number of dioceses, D-I-O-C-E-S-E. -E. And these, in a sense, are like presbyteries, so they're in a geographical area, though probably much more densely packed. They actually picked up the Roman Catholic parish system at that point. Every diocese had a bishop. The bishop then was in charge of ever how many particular congregations were in his diocese. And so you had the archbishop, and then you had the bishops. Under the bishops, you would have the priest um, who served in the churches as well as those who didn't serve, but who then had uh, vicars who they'd pay a, a little bit of money to who would go and actually do the work. And uh, under Romanism, a lot of these men would have three or four, because every, every church had what was called a living. It was the tax money that went to whoever possessed it. And so, you know, you get these livings, and then you put a vicar in your place, and you've got a nice uh, income for doing nothing. Uh, that's, that was the system. So the bishops then were also members of the House of Lords. That's an important thing to know. They were considered to be, because they were the nobility of the church, they were put on common par with the nobility of England. Now, that's, you'll see in this minute how important that was. So, uh, through the bishops, uh, Laud enforced his policies. He uh, suppressed Theophys, F-E-O. I don't think that's, well, that, see that in there? No. F-E-O, F-F-E-E-S. It's part of that landed tax system. So there would be lands that would simply have free income, and they were Theophys. And so a couple of Puritan lawyers got the idea that they would buy the Theophys, and then the income from the Theophys would finance Puritan preaching. Uh, and when Law discovered that, he eventually, uh, although it was perfectly legal, he suppressed them. He himself visited all the dioceses to make sure that things were being properly uh, enforced. Uh, he uh, made hot use of the court of high commission star chamber, so there was, you were tortured till you pled guilty cut off ears. I often wondered what was the deal about ears until I had ear surgery. Ah, there are so many, I have never had that much pain in my life. I had to have a skin graft for the mood of pre-melanoma years ago. Whoa, and I got all those nerves are necessary to hear. You cut off an ear and a guy is in a lot of pain. So he cut off their ears. Um, then, and providentially, his big mistake was he sought to enforce his canons, the Episcopal canons in Scotland, in 1637. Maybe you heard the story of Jenny and her stool. Supposedly she threw the stool at the man who came in to announce the rules for uh, the bishop. Imposed the prayer book in 1637. In 1638, February 28th, the Scots made then the first national covenant that it signed in their blood. Uh, with their blood that they would give their lives in order to restore true religion uh, in Scotland. That then leads to uh, rule by uh, parliament, so back here. So being a steward, James did not care for parliament. Parliament was a very, very unnecessary evil, uh, and he tried to rule without parliament. So he dissolved Parliament in 1629. So he came to the throne, what did we say, in 1625? Yeah. So for, in four years, he dissolved Parliament. Uh, but uh, with this trouble now in Scotland taking place in uh, 38, um, he needed an army. And uh, armies need money. And money need taxes. I think it goes all the way back to Magna Carta. Again, you just think about God's providence and the ripples in the water. It's a glorious. In fact, we were uh, in England a couple times in the past. It was the 800th anniversary, and we actually, at the, the cathedral in Durham, viewed the original Magna Carta. 
But one of the things that came out of that tradition anyway was the king could not tax apart from parliament. So 800 years before, something has started that now causes the steward uh, to have to call a parliament. So he calls a parliament uh, in 1640 uh, to get uh, money uh, to fight in the first bishop's war, which was fought in 1640 and was lost. Uh, now, immediately, because there were Puritans in the short parliament, uh, they <clears throat> began to work against Laud's policies, and of course they resolved. So, the English are always very inventive. Brexit. Uh, <laughs> short parliament. Long parliament. What do you think that means? Exactly what it says. One was very short. It was immediately dissolved. He got his money. They tried to bring reform. He disbanded them. But of course, they lost that first bishop's war uh, in uh, 1640. So he had to call another parliament. So then in uh, November 3rd, 1640, he called the Long Parliament. And you can see immediately why it was called the Long Parliament. Uh, it was a truncated 59 to 60, uh, in 53, I guess it was, that the uh, Presbyterians were forced out. And so then it went on and then and then were brought back. I don't remember the exact uh, order of all that. Anyway, um, full, of, full of Puritans. And uh, they were not going to be uh, dissolved. And so uh, immediately, with, with the selection of this parliament, uh, there was the Root and Branch Petition that came from Parliament that called for the abolition of prelacy. That's another word for bishops, for the church being governed in that, in that day. So the abolition of, uh, of <coughs> prelacy. Uh, actually, that was not Parliament. That was 15,000 signatures December 11th in the London area. Then in November of 27, um, there was the Grand Remonstrance. So that's Parliament. And here Parliament passed a petition addressed to the king, the Grand Remonstrance, accused papists, corrupt bishops, and clergy of subverting religious justice. Of course, had law in mind, too. Wanted the king to limit the power of bishops and deprive them of their vote in the House of Lords. The call was also made for a synod of divines, with some from other parts to submit the results of the discussion to Parliament for ratification and amendment. So that's the first. Uh, reference then to having an assembly of divines. Uh, again, December 10th, there was another petition for removal of bishops from the House of Lords. And uh, in December 20, there was a group of London ministers that brought a petition for Parliament to call for a free synod of grave, that should be grave, learned, and judicious divines and a regular monthly fast. So now the the snowball indeed is rolling. So, because of that, in January 4th, 1642, Charles seeks to arrest five members of Parliament. Again, he broke the law. So many people, even historians, are very much opposed to the execution of the king and whatever in, in the Civil War. And they forget who started the Civil War. He tried to enter Parliament, which was against the law. You could not arrest a parliamentarian while Parliament was in session. He tried to, and he couldn't come in to Parliament. The king couldn't come into Parliament unless he was admitted. They kept him. Um, he then, that August, raised an army against Parliament. He's the one that took up arms against the citizens. And that led to the Civil War. Now, the initial part of the battles were being lost because it was simply people favorable to the Puritans were out there. They didn't have the foggiest notion what they were doing. So Cromwell, who was a member of Parliament, made the, the motion, give me the army. And um, he then really organized the army, and the king was finally defeated at Naseby, uh, June 14, 1645. Laud was then executed. Now, the king was executed in 49. Most of the Presbyterians were opposed to the execution of the king. After all, he was Scott. Um, he was trying to get France to invade his country uh, and release him from a prison. So 
I'm, I'm not one that was opposed to execution of a king. I don't think a king is any more above the law than Samuel Rutherford did when he said the, the law is king, not the king is king. The king is under the law. So now while all this is going on, um, Parliament does uh, respond to the petition uh, to call a, an assembly. And so June 12th, 1643, Uh, Parliament called 120 ministers and 30 laymen invited, about half regularly attended. There were four groups, Episcopalians, Erastians, Independents, and Presbyterians. Now, interestingly, all of these men had Episcopal ordination, something that high church people didn't like to admit. They all had Episcopal ordination. Now, I've right, explained to the Episcopalians. I trust you understand what Independents and Presbyterians are. What were Erastians? That was a question. Erastians think that the uh, civil magistrate has influence. The civil magistrate has ultimate authority in the church. So pretty much the products of the uh, act of supremacy. Uh, uh, and so if there were a few members of parliament that held that view of government. But it's very important to remember that the majority of Parliament were Erastian. So there was a constant struggle between the divines and Parliament in trying to get things passed. And the divines were pushing back every chance they could against that Erastian influence. July 1st, 1643, William Twist was elected moderator, and they began their business on July 8th. Now, in order to uh, fight against the king. They, uh, they needed help. And so they went to the Scots, who had also had been adversely uh, influenced or affected by the king's policies and law. And they sought a treaty with the Scots to fight against the king. Now, out of that treaty, a couple of important things uh, would happen. One is the Solemn League and Covenant was adopted. So here's what the Scots wanted to accomplish. They didn't want to be military allies. They cared about the church and the Reformed Church. So they, and the English agreed to this. We shall sincerely, really, and constantly, through the grace of God, endeavor in our several places and callings the preservation of the Reformed religion in the Church of Scotland, in doctrine, worship, discipline, and government against our common enemies, the reformation of religion in the kingdoms of England and Ireland in doctrine, worship, discipline, and government according to the word of God and the example of the best reformed churches. They didn't demand even they be like Scots, you see. Um, and shall endeavor to bring the churches of God in the three kingdoms to the nearest conjunction and uniformity in religion, confession of faith, form of church government, directory for worship, and catechizing that we and our posterity after us may as brethren live in faith and love, and the Lord may delight to dwell in the midst of us. That's a very wonderful statement. And the English Parliament then, as I pointed out, agreed to that statement. Um, September 25th, 1643. Now Cromwell violated that. I also like a lot about Cromwell. Cromwell is, and I, probably biblically Cromwell, you know, when he made sure that sectarians were not being persecuted and, and such as that, um, was probably on a sounder footing. But this was an oath. This was a, a, a covenant made before God. And I think that the terrible times that came on the uh, English Puritans in, uh, in uh, 1666, so, so soon after Westminster Assembly, uh, when 2,000 men are ejected from uh, their pulpits, uh, I think that part of what the church suffered for those few years, 23 years, whatever they were, were a result of breaking oath in the way that it was broken. But that's a private held opinion. All right. so. The assembly then uh, begins to meet. The other part of the, of the treaty was that the Scots could send 
a number of participating but non-voting delegates to the assembly. So uh, Rutherford and Henderson and Dixon and Gillespie and all the lights were there and had a tremendous influence even though they couldn't vote in shaping uh, the doctrines of the assembly. All right. Westminster Confession of Faith was approved by Parliament in 1647. The Scots approved it uh, in August 27th, 1647. Larger Catechism, 1648, presented to Parliament April 14th. Approved for public printing September 15th. And the Scottish Assembly July 24th, 48. Shorter Catechism, 1648, presented to Parliament November 5th, 47. Approved for public printing along with the Larger Catechism, approved by the Scottish Assembly July 28th, 48. Directory of Public Worship passed the Commons January 3rd, 1645. Uh, and I don't know why I don't have here when it was adopted uh, in uh, Scotland. The former church government in 1645, the House passes resolutions containing the substance of Presbyterianism. This is where the Erastians really put their foot down and didn't get help from the independents, of course. And so that, as I said, is the weakest. Now, these documents, I don't have it with me, uh, a book that we require uh, is uh, the book that my good young friend here already has. And Banner Truth, I've, I've had these old things that uh, Free Presbyterian Church in Scotland uh, uh, republished over the years. Uh, this is all the original documents with prefatory letters, Proof text are written out, confession, catechisms, directory of worship, form of government, and then some wonderful treatises in the back, particularly applying covenant theology to evangelism and assurance for salvation. With him, a nice, has the national covenant spelled out, uh, solemn acknowledgement of public sins and breaches, and then a, a nice index to the uh, catechisms. Uh, Banner of Truth has just redone this now. And it's a completely new typeset. But anyway, we require this. We're going to use it in lots of different courses alongside the, the harmony is good, but when you want these other resources and whatever, this is just a, a, a faithful, faithful standby. Another resource, I really should let you all have a break, shouldn't I? Hmm? Might want a five minute party break. Okay. Yes, sir. The Good Faith subscription to PCA, how long ago was that adopted? Oh. Ten years? About ten years? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Piper? Yes. How do you know if someone just takes Good Faith subscription or not? Just listen to preaching. <laughs> <laughs> how do you find out quicker? <laughs> well, they have to, one thing you do have to do, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, when they're examined uh, to come into Presbyterian, either for licensure and ordination or uh, to transfer, they have to uh, declare their exceptions. And Presbyterian then makes the decision of um, if it's allowable and what, what you do with it. Like if we're trying to find a church to go to, though, is, they, is that like on record? Is well, you used to ask. Uh, yeah. I mean, I can just tell you right now that. Um, Fellowship second oh, not here. Road, we come to community. Here. Okay. <laughs> if you're traveling, Greenville Seminary has a travel log. If you're if okay. you're a uh, uh, Baptist, then this fellow's father and two of our other graduates have an independent Baptist church downtown Greenville. It's interesting things they're doing there and uh, all well trained. That's right. <laughs> yeah, so um, you can most often tell you go to the, a website. That's the Vans Day website. So most, if they call themselves a simple means of grace church, if they've got high view of worship on the Sabbath, then those are the issues you watch for, and you can, you can know. All right, uh, clarification. Some of you did not realize that uh, in the schedule, September 3rd, all that was due today, whatever's required there including those catechisms. I thought she sent a note out, but if she, even if she did, that's okay. Um, I'll give you till the end of the week to 
to get this week's stuff done, but just be sure you got everything caught up by next Tuesday. So but I wouldn't wait until the week. I would get it done. And so whatever day it is, September the 10th, then whatever's listed there will be you're accountable for to have it into her the catechism and for the discussion in the class that day. Is that clear? All right, very good. So um, I guess we are ready. Any questions? And I will. Um, I've got a more thorough paper on uh, the rise of Puritanism. And is it along with the one on uh, subscription? And so somebody's going to send me a note. I'll send you the papers, or she will, and the two PowerPoints. We've got another PowerPoint that we'll be going to right now at this point as we get into chapter one. We've got an hour, I think. We'll just want, oh, let me do this quickly. Some key doctrines, and what we see in the inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture, federal theology, that means covenant theology, which I think is the, the scarlet thread that runs straight through the standards from beginning to end. The sovereignty of God, decree, providence, election, reprobation, literal creation, literal normal day creation, doctrines of grace, the five points of countenance, the regular principle of worship uh, and Sabbath, and a reform piety that just runs straight through standards as well. Particularly the larger catechism. I often say that the larger catechism is the experimental part of the confession. In fact, when I'm often teaching in churches somewhere and I'm dealing with the uh, standards of the larger catechism, I do a little survey. It's not during worship, so it's just in a class. So how many of you have read the uh, Shorter Catechism? And I guess I get most of the hands there. Yeah, we'll do it in here. How many of you read the Shorter Catechism? Come on, David, you read a short catechism. I think David, he's got Presbyterian arms, he don't go above his shoulder. <laughs> How many have read the Confession of Faith? How many read the larger catechism? You're a little better than average, which I would suspect, because you're coming to Greenville Seminary, but uh, it goes down from each. You get to the larger catechism, and that's the fewest hands. When in fact, it really is in many ways, the most glorious document of the whole, particularly when it gets to the experimental part of Calvinism. All right, let's get this other PowerPoint up. There's no short way to do that on this. Oh, yeah, it is really short. So I'll send you this one as well. Somebody like that. That's supposed to go oh. supposed to go away. Why can't it go away? Oh well. All right. So we come now to the uh, first chapter, which is the uh, Holy Scriptures. So it's a, chapter one of the Confession, Larger Catechism uh, 2 through 5, and Shorter Catechism uh, 2. Now as we get into this, just to set the tone, when I talk about a Reformed piety, the very first question of both the Shorter and Larger Catechism establish uh, concept behind everything here. What is the chief and highest end of man? Larger Catechism 1. Man's chief and highest end is to glorify God and fully to enjoy Him forever. And then, of course, the most famous man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. It's interesting, Larger Catechism will make these emphases chief, highest end, fully to enjoy Him. This is the heart of biblical Christianity, which is simply experimental Calvinism. Now it's interesting that many people will rightly point out that uh, the first question of the Heidelberg Catechism is also uh, quite uh, glorious. And that is, what is thy only comfort in life and death? 
that I with body and soul, both in life and death, am not my own, but belong unto my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who with his precious blood hath fully satisfied for all my sins, delivered me from all the power of the devil, and so preserves me that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Yea, that all things must be subservient to my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me sincerely willing and ready henceforth to live unto him. Now, this kind of gives a bit of outline as well of Heidelberg, but, and actually it was a person that holds to the three forms that first said this. What's the great difference between these two? Westminster and Heidelberg. I mean, Heidelberg's a lot longer, but in terms of the essence. <laughs> starting at the end and working backwards. It is, but it's, it's even it's more basic than that. You're right, because it's given a summary, but it's individualized. Very good. It's man-centered. Now, one of the strengths of Heidelberg is it is personalized in that manner. But I'd much rather start my standards with this very God-centered uh, claim that we have in larger catechism and shorter catechism. I, mean, I love Heidelberg one, but I think in terms of setting a tone, we immediately see. You okay back there, Josh? I'll be all right. Huh? I'll be all right. I think you agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> I gave him the choice. Oh, of, I gave him the choice of memorizing Heidelberg, and he took Westminster. Yes, sir. <laughs> sure. Hi, this is uh, Caleb Pupil. Um, could you please define what you mean by experimental Calvinism? Yes. Who is it? Uh, Caleb, Hubel. Well, you're not up there, huh? Uh, I have to turn it off. Well, I'd like to see you one time today. <laughs> Let me turn it on. I can wave at you here. All right. That'll be good, Caleb. Howdy, howdy. Oh, I'm not nearly as good as Timothy, so he's got a daddy beard. He's got a daddy beard. He's got a I do like it. Call him Warfield. Yeah, Warfield. That's a Warfield beard. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Does your wife like it? She's gotten used to it. <laughs> I think I'll try that approach. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. Um, let's turn to uh, something that is experimented is tried. And so experimental or experiential Calvinism, which Ian Hamilton says is simply Calvinism. It's experimental Christianity. It is, uh, well, William Perkins defined systematic theology as um, uh, living well under God. <laughs> That's what theology is all about. Not that I'm going to master 20 different doctrines or truths, but that each one's going to lead me to worship and adore God and to want to serve Him and die for Him. Then, as we deal in preaching, um, we want people then, we want our preaching to give standards that people can examine their own Christian experience and where are they falling out in terms of the biblical standard and then how do they uh, uh, adjust, repent, and by faith uh, will move forward in their sanctification. So those are a couple of things. There's a, that little free book that we give away that puts kind of green cover. It's got Ian's ar article in, I think, on experimental Calvinism. You can also go on uh, Sermon Audio and hear the, uh, the message he gave here a number of years ago. Is that sufficient right now, Caleb? Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Very good. Good question. Thank you. When I used the term, I was thinking somebody was going to ask me about that. So we set the tone uh, with this glorious uh, summary statement of what we're all about. Now the next thing that's different is that the confession moves right into Revelation and Scripture. And that's because the foundation of all that we believe and do must be here in the Bible. And so um, we, uh, we start here. Uh, the three forms start... Um, that's the wrong one. 
with the being and attributes of God, and then go to Revelation, and then Scripture, Apocrypha, and then the Trinity. So I think that, um, again, to lay this foundation of authority is so very important uh, for us. All right. Um, Warfield wrote, there is certainly in the whole mass of confessional literature no more nobly conceived or ably wrought out statement of doctrine than the chapter of the Holy Scripture, which the Westminster divines placed at the head of their confession and laid at the foundation of their system. I think that is a very apt summary of what we have here. It's probably the most detailed, maybe the statement of the law um, as well, but uh, it is indeed uh, nobly conceived and ably uh, wrought. All right, I'll read the first half of the first paragraph. Although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God as to leave men inexcusable, yet they are not sufficient to give the knowledge of God and of his will. And then larger catechism two, how does it appear that there is a God? The very light of nature in man and the works of God declare plainly that there is a God, but his word and spirit only do sufficiently and effectually reveal him uh, to uh, men. So, according to uh, paragraph one, and let's see, Farhad, I guess you're not here yet. So David, according to paragraph one, what are the two ways that God reveals himself? Um, the general creation, uh, David Blizzard, I'm sorry, I'm doing off the bottom. The larger catechism? Uh, yeah, well, are, are, the, are the confession. The two ways to all mankind by which God reveals himself. Creation. And that's one. In providence. That's part of creation. The one before that. Anybody? Scripture No, we're talking about all men. The light of nature. The light of nature. Very interesting uh, concept. So, the light of nature and Creation and providence are the two ways that God reveals himself. And what's another term for this? Natural, natural. natural or general. General, general revelation. All right. Um, <coughs> Calvin in Institutes 1.5 asserts the same thing, the work of creation and providence and the light of nature, the remnant of man's. Now what is meant, you think, by... Uh, light of nature. The things that we can figure out. On what basis are you going to figure them out? Without the uh, the things just that we can see. Um, well, that's out there. Yeah. This light of nature, what does this say? Um, by. Um, the light of nature in man. Is that their conscience? All right, it's conscience and the sense of deity. So at the creation, uh, the law of God was written on the heart of Adam and Eve. And when they sinned, that was not removed. It was distorted. But uh, the light of nature is merely that man has a conscience. And as Paul says, he knows there's a God, though he suppresses that. Uh, but he knows there's a God. Paul's in Romans 2 that uh, conscience You'll be judged by your conscience, by the decisions that, that you make. So light of nature is not natural theology, okay? Natural theology is when people will say that you can develop a theology, a, a biblical theology from the light of nature. Not completely, of course, but uh, foundations. No, uh, we're opposed to that. Calvin was opposed to that. Light of nature is simply that men are responsible and then they see uh, the handiwork of God in creation and providence. Psalm 19, uh, for example, or Romans 1, 
1 and 2. So in the Belgic Confession, we know him by two means. First, by the creation, preservation, and government of the universe, which is before our eyes the most elegant book, wherein all creatures, great and small, are so many characters leading us to contemplate the invisible things of God, namely his eternal power and divinity. As the apostle saith, all which things are sufficient to convince men and leave them without excuse. And they say two things. They simply do. That's the first half of Article 2 uh, there. So this is what we call general or natural uh, theology. And its use then is to reveal God, to leave men without excuse. So Paul will say God's goodness, wisdom, and power. And it leaves man without an excuse because according to Calvin, what are the two reasons men are without excuse? Well, because they know God because they know they have a soul. Because that's the two things they get from uh, the light of nature. But what can natural theology not do? Where's my pen? There's way too much stuff around here. So what can natural theology not do then, uh, Mr. Blotzer? I know what you look like. It's insufficient for salvation. Okay. So it is insufficient for salvation. The second half then of logic of confession, it's um, not sufficient to give knowledge of God and his will, which is necessary in salvation. Therefore, it pleased the Lord at sundry times and in divers manners to reveal himself and declare that his will unto his church and afterwards for the better preserving and propagating of the truth and for the more sure establishment and comfort of church against the corruption of the flesh and the malice of Satan and of the world to commit the same holy unto writing which maketh the holy scripture to be most necessary those former ways of God who ruined his will unto his people be now ceased. And so, um, the only way that we're going to know God savingly, we know a, that there is a God and we're accountable to Him. And when you're witnessing, and somebody used to, used to do it a lot more than do now, I guess, but uh, what about the people in Africa that never heard the gospel? Well, God doesn't condemn in the base of the gospel, our scripture, that they know there's a God, they've suppressed that knowledge, that will be the grounds of the condemnation of uh, everyone who has uh, not come to the Lord Jesus Christ uh, in repentance and faith. So they're without excuse, Romans 1, 19, 20, and 32, and 2, 14, and 15, but not sufficient for salvation. All right, what then are the two stages of special revelation laid out in um, Westminster Confession 1, the second half? Um, Timothy Cook. The two, the two, stages. two stages, two phases of revelation, so to speak. Anybody? Is it his oh. actually doing the acts and writing them down? Yeah. Okay. So the revelatory, the revelation itself, and then the inscripturation of the revelation. So you see, he revealed himself, and then afterwards, for better preserving and propagating the truth, then it was also uh, laid down uh, in uh, scripture. So what are the three ways in Numbers 12, 6 through 8, that uh, God revealed himself in times past. So Hebrews will say in divers manners and ways, what are the three ways? Prophets, confirming, and creation, and scripture. No. Uh, visions, dreams. Visions, dreams, and face-to-face. Uh, face-to-face. Oh. Face -face. Visions, dreams, and face-to-face. -face. 
And that's spelled out when uh, they're complaining about uh, uh, Moses' uh, authority. But uh, that is the ways that God revealed himself through prophets uh, in the uh, Old Testament. Those were the various means. And then, of course, by the apostles, uh, we have visions, for example, in Revelation. And we have uh, uh, dreams, uh, not very often. And we've got face-to-face uh, -face when Christ would actually appear to people like Paul. Um, but part of that revelation of the New Testament is, is inscripturation, <coughs> the inspiration, where the apostles are led as Christ <coughs> promised in John 14 through 16 uh, to uh, write down then what he brought to their memories uh, and to, to interpret rightly what was revealed in the uh, Old Testament. And, what Christ did and uh, said as well. So that is uh, what Scripture is, preserved in writing for our encouragement and instruction, Paul says in Romans 15, 4. It is protected. Um, Notice talks about Satan and the world and the flesh, that uh, there's always going to be this tendency to um, uh, water down the truth of God with crushing of our flesh, the malice of Satan and the world, so it was put uh, in scriptures and they are most necessary so that what does it mean then when it says that uh, now revelation has ceased what is meant by that statement alright the canon, and what's the canon? Is it something you fought a battle with? What's the canon? <laughs> yeah, uh, All right, so the word canon is a measure, and so the measure of what was God's word is the canon, canonicity of uh, scripture, and uh, the canon is closed, which means a couple of things. It means there's no more books going to be added to the 66 books, but it also means there's no further uh, revelation apart from those 66 books. So that is uh, all other means of God's communicating himself directly have ceased and God now communicates the revelation to us through the word. But it's the word alone uh, through which God communicates uh, to us. And so scriptures are necessary then um, Joe Moorcraft says there are three reasons, man's finite mind, incompleteness of in revelation, and man's sin. So here's just a little chart for you to remember. General revelation is conscience, creation, and providence. First revelation, verbal revelation, and then scripture. And of course, 2 Timothy 3.16. That means the scripture is God breathed. It came by God through these men, and God now speaks out through the scriptures by the Holy Spirit and in no other way. All right, a definition of scripture then in paragraph two and three, larger catechism three and four, shorter catechism two and three. Under the name Holy Scripture, or Word of God, written, are now contained all the books of the Old and New Testament, and then they're listed, and uh, Belgic does exactly uh, the same thing with this concluding statement, all which are given by inspiration of God to be the rule of faith and life. So um, they're given by inspiration. Scripture then, how would you define scripture? Holy writing. Hmm? Holy writing. Holy writing, not that's one way. Archbishop Usher said, the word of God written by men, inspired by the Holy Ghost, for the perfect building and salvation of the church, are holy books written by the inspiration of God to make us wise unto uh, salvation. So this is what we have in our Bibles, the word of God. Now what is inspiration? There's some that say it is the concepts. So God revealed the concepts to the men and they 
they expressed them in their own words, but they weren't protected in doing so, so they could have expressed them wrongly. Others will say that it means dictation, and that God actually, uh, they were just stenographers, and God actually dictated each word of scripture to them. Now, the problem with that second one is, all you have to do is read the Bible very much, and you'll find very different literary styles, and very different, uh, vocabulary. So um, in the book I mentioned by Beattie, he says that uh, inspiration is the supernatural, dynamic, plenary, verbal communication of God's truth. Supernatural is the work then alone of the Holy Spirit. Second Peter, holy men carried along. Second Timothy 2. Um, Dynamic. Now, dynamic is used by more modern theologians to describe the first theory I gave you, and that is that it's, it's dynamic, that uh, you know, the truth is there, but not the manner of expression. But by dynamic, he means organic. So in its wholeness, uh, it is, uh, is, is the word of God. Plenary then means verbal. I mean, the fullness and verbal then. So all of it is by inspiration. It's verbal. But it's organic. Now what organic means is that uh, God, who foreordained the writers of Scripture, prepared each one uh, through his uh, mental and um, uh, emotional makeup, his training, uh, gave him his sense of style, his vocabulary, his view of the world, his understanding of God. And then as the Spirit moved in that man, he would write the truth of God being preserved by the Holy Spirit to choose the words out of his vocabulary that were the exact words that the Holy Spirit put into his vocabulary for him to write scripture. So that, I think, is the best way to think about inspiration. The original then was inerrant. And a lot of people don't make a distinction between inerrancy and infallibility. Inerrancy means the original autographs as they were given directly from the Spirit to men contain no error whatsoever. Infallibility is that we recognize that um, uh, there are minor errors in Scripture with respect to spelling and text. Nothing ever affects the truth of Scripture. But they are infallible in all that they teach. And that means not just the doctrine, but the history, the geography, Whatever. So there's still no error in the content of the Bible. It's merely the words themselves sometimes got mixed up as they were being transmitted, uh, never in a way that affected uh, the truth. And then the purpose of Scripture. Uh, Mr. Dwyer, in Larger Catechism 3, No, just tell us. Oh, I'm trying to erase this clock. You can recite if you want to. Uh, no. <laughs> I'll read this. It's okay. Uh, the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testament are the Word of God, the only rule of faith and obedience. Okay. On um, the end of par uh, paragraph two, uh, give my inspiration the rule of faith and life. Uh, our shorty catechism. Uh, the only rule to write is how we may glorify and enjoy him. Picking up now on that theme uh, from question uh, one in the Shorter Catechism. So they've been given to us what we to believe and how we are to uh, live. A paragraph one. Um, yes. I always appreciated uh, in Thomas Watson's uh, Body of Practical Divinity, he said that the two testaments are the two lips um, by which God has spoken to us. That's right. I got that right here in my notes. <laughs> the two testaments are the two lips by which God has spoken to us. It's a glorious statement. Only Watson can frame it that way. Thank you, Sean. All right. Um, negatively, in paragraph 1-3, uh, what... Let me go back one little expression. Look at Shorter Catechism 2. 
the Word of God which is contained in the Scriptures. Now again, if you know modern theology, the neo-Orthodox view of the Bible is that it contains the Word of God, but is not the Word of God. So it becomes the Word of God in its use, or as God might speak to you through it. Is that what they meant? They simply meant that the, the content of the Scriptures is the Word of God. That's how they're using the phrase, contain the Word of God. So what's not then in Scripture, paragraph 3, the books commonly called Apocrypha, not being of divine inspiration, are no part of the canon of the Scripture, and therefore of no authority in the Church of God, nor to be any otherwise approved or made use of than other human writings. So these were the books that appeared primarily between uh, the close of the Old Testament canon with Malachi and uh, the coming then of the Spirit the ministry of prelude to that of uh, John uh, the Baptist. Um, and they are not a part in any way of Scripture. You find the same expression in Belgic 6 to Belgic 6 and, and 2nd Helvetic 1. So they can be used and at times they're referred to in the New Testament. In the same way that Paul might quote the uh, Greek writer Erastus, Artus. Um, and so they can be used as a history. Um, they can be used uh, as a human writer, even if they have some moral precept, but they don't rise to the authority of Scripture. They're full of error. Uh, you just read one and you'll quickly recognize it's not of the same uh, caliber. Now, since the New Testament, we've also had all these spurious Gospels, the Gospel of Thomas and others, and these mostly came out of the cults, out of Gnosticism and, and such, uh, as uh, things as that. And then, we should prize the Word of God. It should be uh, our chief delight. Job prized it. So David in Psalm 119, Oh, how love I your law. It is my delight. It's finer to me than fine gold or, or sweet honey. How, how then do you prize? What does it mean to prize the Word of God? To hold to your heart. Say again? To hold dear to your heart. And how, how do you do that? Put it before other things in your life. All right, so your use of it. Uh, you've got a regular, if you prize the Word of God, if you really think God's speaking to you in it, then you're rarely going to let other things get in the way of opening it in the mornings and listening to what God has to say to you. But sitting under its preaching, morning and evening, uh, a glorious privilege to know that Christ is speaking to us with a living voice uh, through uh, Scripture. And then we prize it, I think this is what Dave was getting at, is we live by it. It goes first in our lives. It's, it's, um, we love its laws, its doctrines, its promises, and we uh, dread its threatenings. We don't want to put ourselves under the chastening hand of God. And so I want each of you to examine himself. Uh, in terms of your practice, do you really, can it be said of you, those that know you, that you prize the Word of God? It takes first place in your life. Well, next we come to the authority of Scripture in paragraphs 4 and 5. The authority of the Holy Scripture for which it ought to be believed and obeyed dependeth not upon the testimony of any man or church, but wholly upon God, who is truth itself, the author thereof, and therefore it is to be received, because it is the Word of God. We may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church to a high and reverent esteem of Scripture, heaviness of the matter, the efficacy of the doctrine, the majesty of the style, the consent of all the parts, the scope of the whole, which is to give glory to God, the full discovery it makes of the only way of man's salvation, and many other incomparable excellencies, and the entire perfection thereof, are arguments whereby it doth abundantly evidence itself to be the word of God, yet, notwithstanding, a full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit bearing witness by and with the word in our heart. So we immediately point out in paragraph 4 that uh, authority of Scripture is not dependent on 
of the word of man or the church. Calvin has a good section on this in book one, uh, uh, volume one, book seven, sections one through five, chapter, chapter seven, one through five. Um, what do they have in mind here? Papal authority. Papal authority. What's the Roman Catholic doctrine of uh, canonicity? Hasn't ceased. Mm -hmm. Technically, hasn't ceased as long as the Pope is on his throne. Even. Well, the, yeah, but I mean, in terms of how the authority of the 66 books of the Bible and the Apocrypha, the, the church, the church made the them canon. Now, Paul says that the church is the pillar and support of the truth, but they're saying that the church makes uh, the truth of Scripture. Uh, and so uh, that is what's particularly in mind when it says that uh, depends not upon the testimony of any man or the church, but wholly upon God, whose truth itself, uh, the author. So God is truth. One of the attributes mentioned constantly throughout the scriptures, particularly in the Psalms. God is the author of scripture, as we've seen, so scripture then must be true. Received then as the word of God to be believed and obeyed. So again, if we prize it, we believe it and obey it. And so at the end of paragraph four, to be received because it is the word of God. Now, the confession gives three standards of, let's see. This is the, the Belgic on uh, the authority, all which the church may read and take instruction from so far as, oh, he's talking again about the apocryphal books, as far as they agree with canonical books, but they're far from having such power and efficacy, as that we may from their testimony confirm any point of faith or of Christian religion, much less detract from the authority of other sacred books. All right, then, the three evidences, I'm gonna call them, I get this from Beatty, external evidence, internal evidence, and spiritual evidence. So, uh, Matthew, Ezel, uh, what is meant by external evidence? Uh, external evidence is, um, for instance, well, the testimony of the church in this case, but also um, the way in which they agree with other things we might see, like the nature of reality or the sinfulness of our heart. No, not quite. Testimony of the church, the witness of the church. So the church does not make the Bible the word of God, but the church has had the role to testify to the Bible as the word of God. Um, Dr. Catechism 4. How does it appear that scripture is the word of God? Um, No, that's paragraph five of the confession. Move and induce by the testimony of the church to a high and reverent esteem of holy scripture. Now, uh, the Roman issues, Augustine who said that if it weren't for the church, I would not have believed the Bible. And Calvin uh, points out that what uh, uh, Augustine simply saying there is that the church did move him by its authority to investigate the scriptures by bearing its testimony to to them. And so Calvin then will write, thus while the church receives and gives its seal of approval to scriptures, it does not thereby render authentic what is otherwise doubtful or controversial. But because the church recognizes scripture to be the truth of its own God, as a pious duty, it unhesitantly venerates scripture. So that's the role of church. It has that role. It's a pillar of support of truth. So it has the, the role then of um, bearing testimony. All right, what's the 
internal uh, witness than uh, Timothy, if I think. scriptures in, in uh, congruence with your conscience and your awareness of God as he has been revealed in your okay, That's a bit age. more of the uh, subjective. If, what I have in mind here is, is what we say that um, we can be uh, the heaviness of the matter, the efficacy of the doctrine, the majesty of the style, the consent of the parts, the full discovery of salvation, many other incomparable excellencies, and repeated then in Raja Catechism uh, 4 um, as as well. So, um, scriptural eternal to itself, you mean? Yeah, okay. that which is in scripture. So, the heavens of the matter is a book that's all about God and man's relationship to God. The doctrine is effective, that it's not confusing, it uh, does convert and sanctify. The majesty of the style is different styles, but there is a, uh, a sublimity and a beauty uh, to Scripture. For the consent of all the parts and scope of the whole, there's a, an agreement. There's no discord, and the end of all is to give glory to God, and the full discovery of salvation, other incomparable excellencies, and incomparable entire perfection. So there are many things in the Bible. I mean, you consider a book that was written over uh, <clears throat> over 1,400 year span, and no no contradictions. And there's a unity that's there. Uh, you consider the fact that biblical writers uh, always showed their own sins and foibles. They didn't cover over that. Uh, they were always pointing uh, to God as as a garment phrase. So there's so much about it in comparison to any other form of written literature that shows that it is superior. So I would want you to be able to know some of these internal evidences uh, that are uh, listed uh, here uh, for us. And then there's what I'm calling the spiritual. Now that, uh, Timothy, is what you're talking about. And that's this glorious statement. Yet notwithstanding our full persuasion and assurance of infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit being witnessed by and with the word in our hearts. This is called the self-authenticating uh, nature of uh, Scripture. Again, Calvin. As to the question, how can we be assured that this is sprung from God unless we have recourse to the decree of the church? It is as if someone asks, whence will we learn to distinguish light from darkness, white from black, sweet from bitter? Indeed, Scripture exhibits fully as clear evidence of its own truth as white and black things do of their color, or sweet and bitter things do of their taste. So write that down, the self-authenticating nature of Scripture that takes place as a person reads the Scripture. So look how the Confession puts it. Um, bearing witness with the word in our hearts um, so that uh, as we read the word, uh, the Spirit then is testifying to us, even right above that, yet notwithstanding uh, our full persuasion and authority is from the inward work of the Spirit bearing witness by, that's what I'm by and with the word. By the word, but with the word. So it's, as you read the word, but it's through the word that the Spirit will bring this to settle upon you. Calvin uses black and white, sweet and bitter. Uh, Owen uses um, uh, light and darkness and uh, the power. So he says the Bible's called light, it's called power. You don't prove either one. You use it. And we assert this, this is part of presuppositional apologetics, over against classical apologetics. We don't prove the scriptures to use them. I have greatest respect for John Gerstner and the guests in my home, but he would have said that you've got to prove to a person uh, the scriptures are the word of God, or at least you've got some authority before you can use them. That's not what the Bible does. Thus says the Lord. It is in the use of scripture that it becomes the sword. Or Spurgeon said, let the lion out of the cage. <laughs> uh, let him loose. 
and God will speak through his word. So you don't have to be intimidated. There's lots of things that we can't answer of people that we try to talk to or witness to or whatever. But we can go to scripture. And they might mock, but you know that they know that you're telling the truth. And it's just Dr. Pasco uses the concept of light of nature to argue for classical classical apologetics. What would you say about that? Well, you can appeal to a person that uh, in their heart they know there's a God, and then what Van Til would say is, and you are robbing from him. You know there's a God, and you can't think without that God, and yet you are excluding him from your epistemology. Is, is Van Til out of line with Kelvin and the Confession, where the Confession is arguing both for the external and internal events, where Van Tilians typically just completely don't ever step there. Kelvin himself in the Institutes is arguing for like martyrs and all these different like Moses, and is actually going through Well, I, I think what we would say as Vantilians is, is that we don't begin there. We don't begin if man's neutral. We assert what the Bible says about himself, and we use it, but then we will bring in, and that's what the confession does, but I think that, I mean, okay. Vantilian you, would as well. What Vantilian, is, is there a, because I read like a Vantil's um, little pamphlet for an unbeliever, and he pretty much, his big point there is like, we've got predetermining God that you're you're this way because God determined you this way and I'm this way because God determined this way and he's sort of working that way but he never actually really brings evidences to the table like Kelvin sort of does and confessional well but he's not dealing with scripture at that point mm -hmm. he's not but he doesn't ever really talk about he does have a thing on evidences maybe Dr. Kurt will get into that no he actually uses evidences yeah. but uh, in, the, in their place so there's nothing wrong with evidences as long as you don't assume neutrality. You challenge a person's presuppositions that they know there is a God and they're lying. Uh, and then you can confirm that by saying, look around you. You know, you're, in your own heart you know, you can tell from creation. Uh, I, I, you know, although they didn't think they agreed a great deal, I really thought that Schaefer was very much a practical Vantilian. And he would take the roof off by showing them then the consequences of their thinking. But y'all get into more of that, and that would be a good question to ask Dr. Kurto. But I don't think there's any great, I mean, I find confession in Calvin to be very presuppositional. Yeah. Second question on the self-authenticating nature. I thought that would more relate to paragraph four of the confession where... It's both, isn't it? Well, by the, the second half of paragraph five, it's not really in one sense self-authenticating because it's being authenticated by the spirit and the heart. So there's, um, there's well, we don't. We never divorce it. No, the Bible is not self-authenticating without the work of the spirit. That's why this is not. Um, the testimonies of God, who is the author. Now, how does God bear testimony by and with the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit doing is by and with the work. That is simply building. I'm understanding you. There's, four is not saying that there is in the Bible a authority apart from the Spirit's testimony through it. I've always assumed that self-authenticating was an objective quality of Scripture, not a subjective experience of it. I think that's an error, though. You see, I think that self-authenticating is as the Bible. That's what Owen said. You don't prove light; you use light. It's and that's what Calvin says. Okay. You use it, and people know there was in white and black or, or sweet and bitter. So but it's always in the use of itself authenticated as the spirit is bearing witness in it. So I, I think this simply is unpacking a summary statement, a negative, not of the testimony of any man, but wholly upon God, the author. So how is God the author? Well, internally, he's put it together this way, but then the most important thing is our full persuasion and assurance of infallible truth and divine authority from the inward work of the Spirit bringing with the spine and with the Word in our hearts. So it's in the use of Scripture that it authenticates itself as the Spirit does that. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Good question. All right. So next in paragraph six, we have the sufficiency of Scripture. 
the whole counsel of God concerning all things for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life is either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture, under which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelations of the Spirit or traditions of men. Nevertheless, we acknowledge the inward elimination of the Spirit of God to be necessary for the saving understanding of such things as are revealed in the Word, and that there are some circumstances concerning the worship of God and government of the church common to human actions and societies which are to be ordered by the light of nature and Christian prudence according to the general rules of the Word which are always to be observed. So here we get into the sufficiency of Scripture. Uh, what areas are covered, uh, Joseph? Uh, some glory, man's salvation, faith, and life. Okay. So the Bible isn't a science textbook, but if the Bible speaks to something that is considered to be scientific, we don't believe it? So part of a worldview is that we recognize that uh, the Bible has a way of doing history. The Bible defines for us certain aspects about words and literature. The Bible gives us uh, various ge geological, geographical, historical information. And as we then pursue uh, uh, these courses of thinking and our callings, uh, we always begin with scripture. That's the foundation, that's the fence, and then we'll build, by God's grace, uh, on scripture principles, then using uh, natural revelation, which is not natural theology, but natural revelation, which actually uh, Isaiah, God says to Isaiah that farming uh, elements that developed methodology were God's revelation. And uh, that, so you know, treat this crop this way, that crop that way, that was by experimentation, but it was God working. Same with logic and rhetoric and those things that are, you don't need the scriptures uh, to know God has worked in those things. So there's a difference in natural revelation and natural theology. Natural revelation then is studying the creation and coming to conclusions always premised upon scripture. And Calvin added that you must always interpret natural revelation by the spectacles of Scripture, never by pure human uh, reason. So this is the sufficiency of Scripture, all that we're to believe and all that we are uh, to do. Uh, the Helvetic, no, the Belgic Confession. We believe that those holy scriptures fully contain the will of God and that whatsoever man ought to believe unto salvation is sufficiently taught therein. For instance, the whole manner of worship which God requires of us is written and then at large, it's unlawful for anyone but an apostle to teach otherwise than we're now taught in Holy Scriptures. Nay, though it were an angel from heaven, as the Apostle Paul saith, for since it is forbidden to add unto or take away anything from the Word of God, it doth thereby evidently appear that the doctrine thereof is most perfect and complete in all respects. Now it's interesting that they actually illustrate this from worship. Uh, which when we come to the regular principle, uh, we'll see again the agreement in, uh, in the standards. Now, one of the things that's pointed out here under sufficiency is there are things that God leaves to the uh, prudent, wise counsel of elders. It's not the elements of worship, but the circumstances. It's not the principles of church and government, but the circumstances. So, that is how we would do the elements. And that is consistent with how those same types of things would be done in the particular culture where you live. So for example, when I'm in Brazil and they sing psalms and hymns to the accompaniment of a guitar, but that's the normal instrument for singing. Um, here, often a guitar is used to make worship more relevant, at which point it's an unlawful circumstance. But if it were necessary, the church had a guitar player, not a pianist. Uh, the acoustics were best for him. There's lots of reasons to do these things. And we don't make ironclad, then, uh, circumstances. Now, the same with church government. When we get to Witherow, there's six principles of church government that will have you memorize. But they'll express themselves in many cultures in many different ways. 
but there'll be the basic principles, but the circumstances then that is left to, not just willy-nilly though, you'll note that um, common to human actions, ordered by the light of nature and Christian prudence according to the general rules of the word, which are always to be observed. So like a general rule, 1 Corinthians 14, all things be done decently in order, Presbyterian life verse. Uh, uh, that's a general rule as we look at circumstances. So the chaos does not uh, rule uh, in our worship. Paragraph seven speaks to the perspicuity of scripture. All things in scripture are not alike plain in themselves, nor alike clear unto all, yet those things which are necessary to be known, believed, and observed for salvation are so clearly propounded and open in some place of scripture or other, that not only the learned but the unlearned and the due use of ordinary means may attain unto a sufficient understanding of them. So what is the doctrine of, of perspicuity? Mr. Hom, another Joseph, not Joshua Hom, but Joseph Hom. Yes, sir. Sorry about that. Um, essentially, uh, chapter seven there, basically, that all things or scripture are not alike plan themselves, but all those things which are necessary to be known, believed, and observed for salvation are so clearly propounded and opened in some place of the scripture or other that not only the learned, but the unlearned and due use of ordinary means may attain unto a sufficient understanding of them. Well, I just read that. Now put that in your own words. Oh, I can't just quote what he said there. That's not bad. <laughs> uh, basically, even dummies like me can open the Bible and uh, take out that portion of it which is necessary to salvation, even if we're not smart enough to uh, get up there among the uh, highly learned in the more detailed doctrines we can take away enough for salvation in our, in okay. our own reading. That the simple, the unlearned can read Scripture with profit. It's not that every place is equally easy and clear what Peter says about Paul's writings. <laughs> um, but um, uh, in the proper use of means, and we're going to cover that in a minute, <clears throat> uh, it, it may be understood. So again, when you're dealing with Genesis chapter 1, which seems to be quite clear, um, nothing obscure or difficult about it, uh, the doctrine of perspicuity Think would push us to say, well, you know, I don't know much about um, Eastern religions or uh, poetry or anything else, but I, I sure can't read words. And <laughs> these words sure seem to mean what I think they mean. So it's actually the, the framework and analogical theories uh, do great damage to the doctrine of perspicuity. And I've heard more than one who an elder or lay person say, why is it only preachers uh, understand this? And on the examination committee, I can tell you, even the young guys out of seminary can't explain it. So in many ways, they deny the doctrine of perspicuity. Well, look, we're out of time. So here's what I want you to do. Um, as you on your own will look at 8 through 10, I want you to um, think about principles of biblical interpretation that you find here, actually 7 through 10, because it's in 7 as well. So I want you to go through here and get principles of biblical interpretation. I want you to come out of this, explain to me why Greenville Seminary emphasizes Greek and Hebrew. And um, then the relationship of scripture to uh, the confession of faith. So principles of interpreting scripture, seven and following. Why study Greek and Hebrew? What should be the rule of a biblical translation, rules for interpretation uh, and supremacy? And you might look at larger catechism 157 in that process as well. And then remember that you do 
so that now next week we should go much more quickly because you will have studied chapters two and three. So as we read it and I ask questions, you're gonna zip the answers off really quickly, okay? And we'll uh, have, continue to have fun together. Any questions? I don't think Van Master could have agreed to natural theology. Yeah, he, he makes a pretty tight distinction between that and pagan theology in his uh, second volume, or maybe his first But is he not really talking about the light of nature? I mean, I, I think so, but I would have to go back and look at the section. Maybe I can do that and I'll come back to Yeah, that would be good. No, I wouldn't agree with him, nor would Calvin. Okay. If by natural theology, you mean developing a background, I mean, the way that Dabney and Hodge, all those guys do it. Um, I've always found it to be completely unnecessary. All right, and if this, you know, if this procedure is working uh, or not working, please let me know. And somebody's going to send me a note to send you these notes. Very good, folks. We're willing. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you for watching this production of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu.